Grab your mason jars, strap on that apron. It's time for Canning with the Diva, making her mark across the globe, teaching you how to safely preserve delicious recipes. Please welcome your host, Diane Devereaux, the Canning Diva. Hey everyone, welcome to season four of Canning with the Diva. This is Diane, your host, the Canning Diva. I hope everyone is doing well and getting ready for another exciting season of gardening and canning and preserving and doing all we can to fill our pantries and our freezers and our storage areas full of food to enjoy consuming throughout the years to come. Today we're going to talk about canning and corning your own corned beef. So it's pretty exciting. This will be a fun segment that allows us to take those cheaper cuts of beef that we see in the store, corn them into something absolutely delicious. And then using the recipe from my cookbook, Canning Full Circle, we are going to take that corned beef and we are going to make corned beef hash and preserve it in jars. I'm telling you right now, this is one of my most favorite breakfast recipes that is super easy. You don't have to corn your own beef. You you may purchase it in the store. I will do that sometimes, especially after St. Patty's Day when there's a bunch on sale and I'll go ahead and I'll freeze it or I'll get it home, rinse it off, get it into jars and make corned beef hash. But then I find if I miss the sale or I don't get my hands on enough, corning my own beef is a really awesome way to save some money, uh, take those those less tender cuts of beef and turn it into something magnificent. Now, that does mean we're going to let it sit a bit longer uh, during the corning process in the refrigerator, but that's okay. Patience is a virtue, right? And then um, from that, we have a lot of really delicious recipes we can make. Now, for those of you that have Canning Full Circle, my revised and expanded edition, the corned beef hash recipe is on page 183. If you don't want to make corned beef hash, but you want to corn your beef and use it in other ways, I have an amazing recipe in my cookbook, The Complete Guide to Pressure Canning, called Irish Jig in a Jar. I'm not kidding. That is my, you know, after a while I have to stop saying, that's my favorite. That's my favorite. No, that's my favorite. But they, it truly, <laughs> they're truly my favorites. I love Irish Jig in a Jar and I absolutely enjoy having several quarts of that on my pantry shelf at any given time because it truly makes a delicious, quick and easy meal. And for those of you who've made it, I know you're nodding your heads in agreement. It is absolutely delicious. And it's super easy to make. So if from today's episode, you simply learn how to corn your own beef and turn it into the recipe of your choice, that's awesome. If you want to tune in all the way through, you're going to learn not only how to create your own corned beef, but we're going to pressure can corned beef hash. So let's dive in. Okay, so with the process of corning, you don't have to just do beef. Keep in mind, if you happen to have a, a huge pork loin that's been in your freezer for a while, um, po poultry even, it doesn't have to be beef. Okay, so keep that in mind. Anything can be corned. The same um, pink curing salt that's used to corn beef is also used to make bacon. It's used to make jerky. There's a lot you can do with it, but uh, just know that for the sake of today, we're going to talk about beef, but you can, you can swap out any meat or poultry for this recipe. It does not have to be beef. So that's kind of cool. What we're going to focus on is a single batch. Now, for those of you who want to get very adventurous and double or triple it, all you've got to do is that simple math. I'll give you the basis, which is a single batch. And as long as you have a vessel, for instance, plastic, glass, ceramic, something that's deep enough that fits in your refrigerator, because we're going to corn this using the refrigerator, it's got to be in cold storage, um, have at it or multiple dishes, right? I just, whatever works for you. I just want you to have fun with this and really start finding 
some amazing recipes to utilize this corned beef. Okay, I'm going to run through the ingredient list. For those of you taking notes, um, I will go through it a second time because I, I like to sometimes talk or explain or give some substitutions. So I'll run through the ingredient list with those notes in mind, and then I'll run through it a second time so that way you can jot everything down and you don't have to worry about rewinding and missing anything. So for starters, I tell individuals between two and a half and three pounds of beef is adequate for this recipe. Now, many of you may think that you have to use brisket. Brisket is common when you're corning beef, but it's not a requirement. You may use what cuts you have on hand. I have personally corned top roast. I've even corned bottom because that's all they had at the store and I and I needed to corn some. I've corned chuck roast without issue. Uh, honestly, there's there really isn't a wrong cut. The lesser of the fat content, you just want to leave it go just a bit longer in the refrigerator. Um, it's not going to harm anything. It's just going to tenderize it more. Just so long as you have between two and a half and three pounds, you'll have enough to make a, a batch, okay? You'll also want to have two tablespoons of uh, mustard seeds. I love to add a little bit extra of the red pepper chili flakes, you know. Um, I don't do it because I want it spicy. It doesn't make it hot. It just pulls in a really good flavor. So I tell individuals between one and two tablespoons of the uh, red pepper flakes or chili flakes, okay? And then I like to make sure that I have one tablespoon of peppercorns. And then one heaping quarter cup of traditional pickling spice. Now, your traditional pickling spice is going to have a combination of a variety of different spices. And you're going to find that anywhere on the pantry shelf uh, because you're pickling, right? You're already you're already doing some pickles. Or if you don't have any and you have to go to the store, you're going to find it at pretty much any grocery store. It's a lot um, more cost effective to buy it in bulk versus all of the individual spices and creating your own. But if you have your own pickling spice that you use, you may use it for corning beef. There's no wrong way. Okay. And then I, because there's already bay leaf in the pickling spice, I don't necessarily add extra, but I do take two cinnamon sticks and I crush those up and I put that into the spice mix. Okay. You'll want one cup of pickling salt, and you'll want a half a cup of brown sugar, and then you'll need at least three cloves of garlic. You can you can add more if you'd like more garlic, but at least three cloves, and go ahead and chop them coarsely or mince them. And then you'll need five teaspoons of pink curing salt. Now, pink curing salt is entirely different from table salt and any other edible salt. Pink curing salt is not edible. They make it pink for this reason, so we can identify it. You do not want to use that in your everyday cooking. You do not want to use that as a topping. This is only for that curing process. It is a curing salt, and it is made into a reddish pink color, so that way we don't accidentally use it. It's not similar to Himalayan pink salt. There is a distinct difference, so just keep that in mind. Plus, you're going to see notices all over the label not to uh, consume, all right? Keep it separate in your, in your, I wouldn't even put it in your spice cabinet. I put it, mine personally, downstairs in a completely separate area in my pantry. I don't even have it upstairs in my um, spice cabinet because I do not want my kids to accidentally think, oh, cool, it's a hot pink salt. No, it's not. Don't add that to your food. <laughs> okay, so let's run through these again. You're going to want two and a half to three pounds of beef, whether it's chuck, top, bottom round, or brisket. You can even do beef uh, silver side. You're going to want two tablespoons of mustard seeds, one to two tablespoons of red pepper chili flakes, one tablespoon of black peppercorns, I love adding two cinnamon sticks crumbled up. And then you're going to want one cup of pickling salt, a half a cup of brown sugar, three garlic cloves minimum, and then five teaspoons of pink curing salt. Okay, now 
some people truly believe that toasting your spices first give it um, some depth of flavor. I haven't ever done that, but if that's something you would love to do, uh, feel free to toast them in a small frying pan uh, until they're fragrant. And I wouldn't do high heat. I would do medium. I actually just mix them all up into a bowl and I don't bother to heat and crush. Um, I, I seem to have just as, as good of an outcome. But again, if you want to take it that extra step, heat it through, toast them, crush them, and then add it to the mix. Okay. If you're like me, I just put all of the spices <laughs> into a bowl and I mix them all up. I keep it super easy, e super easy, excuse me. Um, one thing I will use the stove top for though is the brine. Okay, so now for the brine, you're gonna want 16 cups of water. You're gonna want your pickling salt. You're gonna want your brown sugar. And you're going to want the pink curing salt. You're going to bring that to a boil on the stovetop, and you're going to stir so that everything is dissolved, okay? Then what I do is I allow that brine to cool to room temperature, and I add it to the vessel I'm going to store in the refrigerator, and I'm going to use to submerge the meat in. Now, I'm pretty fortunate. I have a round, flat bottom Tupperware that's been given to me. I don't know how long I've had this thing, and it just works out perfect. It's about seven inches tall, so it's very, it's deep enough for the cuts of beef. Now, if the beef is large, you can cut it into smaller pieces. It will not harm anything. It'll just, you've got to work with what you've got. So whether it's ceramic, stainless steel, I wouldn't use any other metal than stainless. If you can use glass, ceramic, or plastic, please do so. Stainless would be your last resort. But you want to get that brine into the vessel in which you're going to submerge the meat. Um, after you get that cooled brine in there is when I add all the spices. Now, some people love to infuse the brine with the spices on the stovetop. There's no wrong way. You may do that. I just feel that it becomes a bit of a pain trying to get everything out of the pot into the vessel for the storage. So I do it just a tad bit different. Um, but again, as long as your brine has everything... Uh, dissolved so that salt and sugar and the pickling spices you're good to go and then mix all of your spices into the brine and then slowly and carefully add your meat to the brine ensuring that the whole cut is covered you don't want anything standing above the brine if you have to double up your brine or make an additional you know four cups of um water. It, it, uh, you just want to make sure you do the math to deduce the salt, the sugar, and make sure you're adding an additional uh, teaspoon of curing salt, the pink. All right. So now, once you have all of the meat in the vessel, sometimes you'll see as you're kind of putzing around the kitchen before you put the lid on, that a piece of the meat kind of has floated. If you have to use a ceramic plate on top of the meat to hold it all down and submerge it under the brine. I personally um, haven't had to do that too often. If it has a, a fattier content, I've had to submerge it using a plate. Uh, do what's right for you. You just want to have some weight on it because you don't want the meat to be exposed to the air. Okay, it has to be submerged. And then go ahead and put your lid on to whether it's a Tupperware or, or ceramic um, uh, or even a stainless steel glass. It doesn't matter. Just make sure it has a lid and you're going to put that into the refrigerator. Now, I like to let mine go for three weeks. I've had some individuals that turn it around in two weeks. I like three, especially because I sometimes get a tougher cut of meat. And um, I just want to make sure that everything is properly submerged. Three weeks is usually what I have found to be th the best, uh, getting everything nice and tender. The the flavor is truly there. Just make sure that how whether it's two to three weeks, after it has brined in the refrigerator, you want to rinse it thoroughly before you use it in a recipe, whether you're cooking or whether you're canning. Just make sure you rinse that off very thoroughly so that you're not um, munching on those seasonings or getting some of that uh, 
sometimes it's I, I don't know if you notice this, like even when you buy it in the store after it's been corned, it has like this unique gel like um, texture, a capacity over and around the, the cut of beef, usually brisket. And it's like the coagulated fats and everything just seems to make like a gel. Uh, you don't want that in your food. You don't want it in your slow cooker. You don't want it in your corned beef hash. So rinse that off very well. Plus, you also don't want to um, accidentally get you know, a large chunk of uh, cinnamon bark, you know, when you go to take a bite of your corned beef hash, you don't want that in there. So make sure that you're rinsing off all the seasonings from the meat and of course, any anything else that may have uh, derived from it brining. Now, when you're ready to use it, whether it's Irish jig in a jar that can be found in my book, The Complete Guide to Pressure Canning, or it is corned beef hash from Canning Full Circle, from garden to jar to table. I'm very proud of this uh, revised and expanded edition. Uh, just know that when you make the corned beef hash, you're going to yield seven quarts or 14 pints. Now, corned beef hash, I mean, this goes back, geez, they called it the Depression era food. It was a hearty mix of protein and carbs and fat. And it was designed to be one of those stick to your ribs type type of meals. And, you know, I used to love buying the aluminum canned version in the store. I I, I mean, who didn't, right? I mean, if you love corned beef hash, you 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 ate it as, as much as you can get your hands on it, right? Well, it wasn't until I made it myself years back that I went, oh my goodness, I'm never buying store-bought again. <laughs> you start looking at the difference between the level of corned beef, the, the size of the potato, and then truly how much fat is in the jar and you go, why, or in the can, excuse me, you go, why would I, why would I do that again when I know I can make it myself? Now, I'm not going to lie, I still have a couple aluminum cans in my pantry because you just never know, right? If I run out or, you know, some of us like to be prepared for that. Uh, what's that? Uh, you know, excuse me, the S-H-I-T hit the fan. <laughs> so, you know, I don't, I do not chastise anyone. I don't. If you use aluminum canned commercial food in addition to your home can. Oh, my dog's going nuts. Stay with us. We'll be right back. At Canning University, we're unlocking the flavors of food preservation year-round. Dive into a world of safe and confident canning with our range of digital classes. From principles of pressure canning to the art of pickling, there's a course for every taste. Enjoy diverse learning mediums, including engaging videos, interactive PDFs, exclusive podcasts, and course certification to prove your skills. Join us on this delicious journey. Enroll now at canning.university. My daughter just got home, so my dog's going nuts. But anyway, um, the beautiful thing about corning your own beef hash and putting it in a jar is once you've had it from scratch, you're likely never to eat store-bought again unless you absolutely have to. Or if you're out at a restaurant and, you know, they don't make it, they buy it, right? And then serve it to you. Uh, you're going you're gonna to be so pleased with this recipe. Now, when you go to make this, you'll want to make sure that you have doubled up on the corned recipe. So the, the ratio of brine and seasonings I originally gave to you for the corned beef was for three pounds, two and a half to three pounds. Three pounds is optimal. You're going to want to just slightly more than double it because you, you want to yield 15 to 17 cups worth of corned beef. And that's going to be about seven to eight pounds. It's it's okay if you only have the, the lower end. It's not going to hurt anything. You just might have a jar less than what I had intended the recipe to be, which is seven quarts or 14 pints. Um, sometimes you, you, just, you just make the recipe based on what you have because it's going to process the same. 
And what your initial ingredients are is what is pretty much how many jars you wind up with. So if all you had on hand was the three pounds of corned beef that we discussed earlier, that's okay. You're just, in, in essence, making a half batch, okay? So no no fretting, no worrying. Just use that uh, culinary math skills of yours and, you know, recognize that if you didn't get enough corned by yourself initially, it's okay. You're just going to have a half batch of corned beef hash on your pantry. Not a big deal. All right, so seven to eight pounds of corned beef, which is going to yield between 15 and 17 cups. Then you're going to want to make sure you have two tablespoons of pickling spice in a spice bag, okay? Uh, You're going to need a quarter cup of butter, two large onions chopped so that you yield three cups, five pounds of potatoes, and you want to peel and cube them. And I like them cut into half-inch cubes um, because they are going to cook down some. When they're pressure canned, they will shrink slightly. No matter what, you want to make sure with those five pounds of potatoes that you yield 10 cups of cubed, okay? Now, if you like them bigger, you can make them bigger. I prefer them a little bit uh, smaller, like half an inch. If you like them larger, that's okay. Just make sure they're uniform. All right, you're also going to want two tablespoons of minced garlic and one teaspoon of black pepper. Now, as I said earlier, rinse your corned beef, whether it's store-bought or you've made it yourself. And then I want you to place it in a deep saucepan or stainless steel stock pot. I want you to cover it with water. And then I want you to add that spice bag. And I want you to bring it to a boil over medium-high heat. You're going to then reduce the heat and cover it. Simmer now for 45 minutes undisturbed. When you're done, you're going to remove the corned beef from that stock pot. You're going to set it onto a cutting board and you're going to allow it to cool. You can then discard the water and the spice bag. Now, once that corned beef has cooled, I want you to cube the corned beef into half-inch pieces and set it aside. In a large stainless steel stock pot, I want you to add the butter and the onions, and I would like you to cook that over medium-high heat until the onions are translucent, which takes uh, anywhere from 8 to 10 minutes. Next, I want you to add the potatoes, and I want you to add the corned beef, garlic, and the black pepper, and then just mix it really well. Now, the goal here isn't to cook it down, okay? So don't get don't get too crazy on me. I want you to have this on the stovetop long enough to cook for about mm, five minutes, which is going to blend the flavors, and it's going to evenly disperse the ingredients. That's the whole goal of getting it on that stovetop and getting it warmed through. We don't want to cook it longer than that five minutes, okay? So keep it moving. Make sure that you're blending all the flavors. Now, using a funnel, I want you to ladle the hash into your jars, leaving a half an inch of headspace. Remove any air bubbles and add additional hash if necessary. Now, you're packing that in there, okay? You're packing it in tight. You're not just throwing it in and leaving a bunch of air pockets. You don't have to cram it in there like it's ground beef, all right? But you do want to pack it in there so that you can fit as much into the jar as possible. Wipe the jar rim of each jar with a clean washcloth dipped in vinegar. And then I want you to place those lids and rings on each jar and hand tighten. Now, for those of you with pressure canners, whether it's a stovetop or a digital canner, it does not matter. They're going to process the same. Digital canners do not require any adjustments. You're going to treat it just like you would a stovetop canner when it comes to the processing times. So what I want you to do is I want you, if you are at zero C level like me, to process at 10 pounds of pressure. Depending on your elevation, you may need to adjust that. If you're using a digital, uh, depending on the version, the Presto will do that automatically. The Nesco allows you to up it to 15 PSI. Process your quart jars for 90 minutes and your pint jars for 75 minutes. And remember, after processing and after your canner is safe to open because there's no PSI in the vessel, there's no pounds of pressure, it's at zero, let your jars sit for a good five minutes before removing them to cool. It just helps let everything calm down a little bit before you agitate that jar to remove it from the canner. Just let it sit. Okay. Now, 
I am super excited for all of you because not only is this one of my favorites, if you corn your own beef, you can also make Irish jig in a jar. Now, let me get that one for you. I'm just going to tell you where this one is located. I'm going to give you a quick gist of the ingredients and a quick rundown. Now, this is from the Complete Guide to Pressure Canning. And this one is located on page 182. Isn't that funny how I did that? It's page 183 in the canning full circle, and it wound up being page 182 in Irish Jig in a Jar. I did not plan that because I wrote these books so many years apart. <laughs> but I just thought that was kind of comical. Like, how did I do that? It must have been subliminal. I had corned beef on the mind, and that's how it went into the book. Isn't that funny? Okay, so for Irish Jig in a Jar, you're going to want eight cups of beef bone stock, two 12-ounce bottles of a pale ale or a hard cider. I prefer the hard cider. I just love how it tastes. It's To me personally, I like it better, but you have a choice between a pale ale or a dry hard cider. Okay, half a cup of pickling spice, one head of green cabbage, seven bay leaves, seven garlic cloves, two four pound corned beef briskets or any cut. Remember, I told you any cut. And then you want to cut the corned beef into two inch pieces. You'll want eight to 10 medium red skin potatoes, and those are going to be cut into two inch cubes, which will yield four cups. And then you'll want four cups of chopped carrots. I suggest a half an inch um, to an inch. Okay. And then four cups of chopped onions. Now, this recipe is, again, it's, it's just so yummy. I've had individuals reach out to me and say that they changed up the beer. They didn't do a pale ale. They did a stout, and they loved it. So have some fun. Get creative. If you don't drink alcohol, that's okay. You're not going to have the alcohol in the food. But if you prefer not to get anywhere near alcohol, don't worry about it increase your beef bone stock. Okay. You don't need the alcohol. Um, but for those of us that love having either the hard cider, a stout or a pale ale, um, try the hard cider first. Tell me what you think. <laughs> okay. So for this, you're going to want to use wide mouth jars because we're going to, um, kind of raw pack some of the ingredients first, and then we're going to cover it with the, uh, yummy, we're going to call it, it's not really a brine because we're not pickling anything. We're going to call it the uh, seasoned stock. Okay. So what you're going to do is you're going to get a stock pot. You're going to combine the beef bone stock, the ale, the hard cider, or the stout, whichever one, and the pickling spice bag. Now you're going to bring that to a boil and you're going to boil for one minute. Oh, and you don't have to put it in a bag. I take that back. You can leave it open, and I've done that purposely, and I love having that. I, the, the peppercorns are nice and tender when you go to eat them. So if you don't want the individual spices throughout each jar, put it in a bag, okay? All right. Now, bring it to a boil, boil for one minute, then reduce the heat, and I want you to simmer those seasonings with that liquid mixture for five minutes. The goal is we're infusing that delicious uh, stock with the spices. Okay. And in order to do that, um, you definitely want to have a tight fitting lid because we're going to let that simmer and infuse. Now you're going to cut the cabbage into three inch thick wedges lengthwise, and then you're going to cut crosswise into pieces so that they easily fit into the jars. And then what we want to do is we want to take these room temperature jars and I want you to start by adding one bay leaf and one garlic clove to each jar. Then in layers, I want you to add two cups of the corned beef pieces. Then I want you to add a half a cup of potatoes, half a cup of carrots, and one or two cabbage, excuse me, cabbage wedges. Say that 10 times fast. <laughs> so you're just going to kind of work through that amongst your jars. This is going to yield seven quarts or 14 pints. If you're canning in pints, you'll do half of that. Okay. So let me go through that again. If you're using the quartz, it's two cups of corned beef pieces, evenly distributed, all right? Half a cup of potatoes, half a cup of carrots, one or two cabbage wedges. I did it again. And then you're going to pack that down 
and add two tablespoons of onion. The goal is to keep a generous inch of headspace, which in essence is one and a quarter inches. Once you get all of your jars raw packed or raw stacked, because that's essentially what we're doing, you then ladle the warm spiced broth into each jar and you fill that to a one inch headspace. So notice we're putting the food to be a bit lower because we want to make sure we have enough of the spiced broth over everything to where you're not worrying about something sticking up, okay? Remove any trapped air pockets and then add additional spiced broth if necessary. Be sure to maintain that one inch headspace. Wipe each of your jar rims with a warm washcloth dipped in vinegar and go ahead and get those lids and rings on there and hand tighten. Now this too is going to process 90 minutes for quarts, 75 minutes for pints, no different than the corned beef hash. And just know that you are in for a special treat. So right in, right here in today's episode, you were able to corn beef, you're able to get some breakfast dishes on your pantry shelf, you're able to get some meals in a jar on your pantry shelf. You just took one item, made it yourself, and then had multiple uses. How exciting. And anything left over, you can throw in the crock pot and make for dinner that very evening. So that way you're canning and feeding your family, well, now and for later, right? <laughs> Oh, you guys, it's going to be a fun 2024. We have a lot in store. I have so much to share with all of you. And I, I, I just, I thank you all for tuning in, for downloading. Be sure to share my podcast. It's going to be far more robust this year. And I'm going to have some really fun premium content. And we're, we're just, I've got a lot going on and it's going to be a lot of fun. And I want you all here to be along for the ride and the awesome canning journey. But thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, happy canning. Thank you for listening. Be sure to tune in next week for another episode of Canning with the Diva. For tips, recipes, and techniques, please visit us online at canningdiva.com.